You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make prize picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three-pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less, it's that easy. And welcome to History of the Great War, episode 13. Last week, we journeyed into the east to find out what had been happening in Serbia and Prussia during the first few weeks of September. This week, we travel back to the Western Front, and when we last visited this area, the German advance through France had been halted at the Battle of the Marne, and the German 1st and 2nd armies had begun to retreat in the direction that they had come. This week, we continue to follow the events in this area, as the German, French, and British troops meet again along the Anne River. The result of this battle begins what is called the Race to the Sea, as the armies fight a running series of battles that slowly wind their way north through the English Channel. This is a very critical few weeks for the armies on the Western Front, as the results of the Race to the Sea will set the stage for the trench warfare of the next four years that would become the hallmark of the war. The Battle of the Enne took place after the German army retreated from the events of the Battle of the Marne. After the Germans had decided to retreat, Moltke ordered them to retreat to the Enne River and to fortify their positions to prepare for a defense against the French and British. The Entente armies helped the Germans out at this stage by not quickly following up their victory on the Marne and allowing the Germans to prepare defenses around the Enne River. The Germans were the only army to focus on defensive operations before the war began. As early as 1904, they had begun making trench digging and field fortification creation part of army exercises. The German leaders had realized that these field fortifications would be invaluable if the German army was ever in a position where they needed to defend against the advance of a foe. Compare this to the British and French doctrine that was actively averse to such defenses. At the same time that the Germans were digging in on both sides of the river, they were starting to pull troops from the south to bolster their lines in the north. This movement meant that both armies would be standing on the defensive in the south, as the troops simply wouldn't be available to carry out offensive operations. This movement is what begins a trend that you will see throughout this episode, where the commanders of the armies are constantly setting their troops on the southern edge of the battle on the defensive, so that they can be stripped of the troops to be moved north to try and outflank the enemy. This type of movement would be the cause of the race to the sea. Right now we are getting a bit ahead of ourselves, so let's get back to the banks of the Enne. The Enne is a deep and wide river, and thankfully for the Entente troops, when the battle began there were still bridges that they could use to cross. There was a 500 foot high ridge behind the river that the Germans had fortified, which gave them a nice view of the battlefield in front of them. On this line was the soldiers of the German 1st and 2nd armies that had been fighting since Liège. At the Marne they had been exhausted, and while they had been digging in on the Anne, they had been able to receive some rest, which was critical. They would be reinforced by the 7th army that was being brought in from Alsace. It was originally thought that this army would be moved in from Alsace, 
and would be used to resume the offensive. But instead it would end up being used to fill the gap that still existed between the first and second armies. The primary French troops making the assault were the fifth and sixth armies, which you may remember from the Battle of the Marne. These troops had been on the move since the Battle of the Marne, and they probably wouldn't fall into anybody's definition of fresh. They had, however, much like their German counterparts, received some reinforcements from the south. The British would play a big role in the fighting on the Anne, and they would use pretty much the entirety of their small army during the fighting. The British troops would be the first to cross the Anne River on September 13th, and begin the attack on the German lines. They were lucky enough to find an intact bridge that they used to push strongly against the German lines. In his book, A World Undone, G.J. Meyer quotes a German officer, and this is a pretty long quote, but trust me, it's worth it. And I quote, Three days ago, our division took possession of these heights and dug itself in. Two days ago, early in the morning, we were attacked by an immensely superior English force, one brigade and two battalions, and were turned out of our positions. The fellows took five guns from us. It was a tremendous hand-to-hand -hand fight. How I escaped myself, I am not clear. I then had to bring up support on foot, and with the help of the artillery, we drove the fellows out of the positions again. Our machine guns did excellent work. The English fell in heaps. The French 6th Army was attempting to flank the German army to the northwest, around the French city of Compiègne, but they would be unable to accomplish this task in their attacks over the next few days. On the other side of the line, the French 5th Army was able to find the gap between the German 1st and 2nd Armies. The 7th Army was arriving, but had been unable to position itself into this gap as the French began to advance. By September 14th, the British troops were being told to entrench any position that they were able to take across the Enne River. By September 17th, the 7th Army had managed to halt the French advance, and while Joffre continued to hope that the attack would be successful, he was forced to admit that all that the French troops could do was keep the enemy under threat of an attack, and not actually attack. During the last few days of fighting along the Enne, before the fighting began shifting definitively to the north, the Germans were able to launch some vicious counterattacks but were unable to push the French and British back across the river. After September 17th, trench warfare developed along the line of battle that would soon spread to the entire front. Both armies were digging in around the end, and the battle line in this area would not change greatly for several years, even though many men would die trying. As I mentioned earlier, this is when the race to the sea really began. By the middle of the battle on the end, both Joffer and Falkenhayn realized how important it was to get troops further north, where the line wasn't so settled and hard to break. They began playing a balancing act that they would be playing until November, by trying to leave just enough troops on the current battle line while moving every available body further to the north to carry on the battle. Both of the armies had stripped as many soldiers from Alsace and Lorraine as possible, and soon they were pulling troops from even closer to the battle as they wound north. This presented some logistical nightmares for the people responsible for moving the armies. A single army group took 140 trains to move around, and the Germans especially suffered from the damage that their rail lines had suffered in northern France at the retreat of the French and British troops. The French were in a better position, because most of the rail lines on their side of the battle had not yet been touched by the war, and so they were still in pretty good shape. It is important to note that while it is called the race to the sea, the armies didn't just put on their running shoes and sprint for the English Channel. The name Race to the Sea is sort of a wrong name to call it. Instead of just moving to the coast, the two armies would be fighting a series of running battles over the next two months, as the battle just kept shifting further to the north. We won't be covering the entirety of the Race to the Sea today, or this episode would be an hour long. Instead, we will just cover the first four of the battles. Separating these battles seems a bit arbitrary to me, because they are mostly just one long, continuous action. But history has split them up, and we shall as well. Our first battle is the Battle of Picardy, which would run from September 22nd to the 26th. This battle would be fought by the French 6th and 2nd Armies. If you remember, the 2nd Army was originally far to the south. Well, this is a new 2nd Army, made up of part of the 2nd Army, and part of the 6th Army, and part of the 1st Army. Did you get all that? 
because I'm very confused. Basically, at this point, troops were moving so fast that the French and Germans were creating new armies on the fly that at times were amalgamation of other armies. Sometimes they would be given new names, like the French 10th Army, that we will meet later today, and sometimes they took the number of their predecessor. What this means is that if you do happen to remember anything about the positioning of armies from before, you should probably just try to forget it, because the same numbers will start popping up again in very different places. So the French 2nd Army was formed out of all these pieces, and put under the command of General Cassinal. It would be facing the German 1st and 6th Armies. The 6th Army was again an amalgamation of a bunch of German formations stripped from all along the front, and put under the command of Crown Prince Rupert. The French would be the first to attack during the battle, as they moved up the Oise River Valley to try and move around the Germans on the Aisne. They ran smack into the German 6th Army that was just arriving from Lorraine. The French had some initial success, mostly due to the fact that the German troops were still arriving and getting settled. As more Germans began to arrive, the French advance slowed, and then came to a halt. Joffre would then commit his, at this moment at least, last reserve corps into the battle, in an attempt to keep it moving, but to no avail. By the 25th of September, the battle had stagnated, and the troops began digging in. The generals began to realize that attacking in this area was going to be difficult, and they began, you're going to get tired of me saying this today, to move their main points of effort to the north. The Battle of Albert would be started on the 25th of September due to the movements of troops to the north. As the Germans and French began moving troops to the north out of Picardy, they began to meet each other in the vicinity of Albert. The Battle of Albert would run for four days, between September 25th and September 29th. Now this is still the French 2nd and German 6th armies, and on the German side, it was primarily the 21st and 1st Bavarian Corps, who were literally just stepping off the train from Lorraine. The Germans began the attack on September the 25th, and met with some success along the line, as the French were not yet well positioned this far to the north. The Germans continued to commit more troops to the battle, as more arrived from Lorraine, and by the 27th they had pushed back the French forces in the area, which were at this point mostly reserve formations. The German advance would begin to grind to a halt around the 28th, as the French moved troops to the north to meet the new German attack. Once the Germans began slowing down, the French counterattacked in an effort to drive them back off their recent gains, but these attacks met with little success. As soon as the German attack began slowing on the 28th, both sides began frantically digging in across the front, in pretty much whatever positions they found themselves in. In the days after the 29th, when the battle is considered to have finished, troops would continue the attacks in this region without any real gains to show for it. After the 29th, Falkenhayn and Joffre began shifting divisions, you guessed it, to the north of Albert, into the area around Arras. The Battle of Arras would occur from October 1st to October 4th, and the Battle of Arras in 1914 shouldn't be confused with the Battle of Arras in 1917. Yes, the two armies will be right here in 1917, which I guess spoils the results of the battle we are discussing now. But I bet you knew the result anyway. This began as a spillover from the Battle of Albert, and was also the first appearance of the French 10th Army. Joffre had taken the 10th and 16th Corps from the Alsace-Lorraine region, and moved them north by rail, using the mostly intact French railways. The two corps were to be moved to the north, and were to be used to turn the German flank the goal of the French for the entirety of the race to the sea. They would eventually be commanded by the general Louis Madhu, who at this point was commanding a piece of the French 2nd Army. At this point, the 2nd Army had grown quite large. Under its umbrella were eight corps, stretching over a hundred miles of front. An army this large was quickly becoming unwieldy and difficult to control. During the Battle of Arras, the troops under Madhu would be broken off, and joined with the troops arriving from the south to create the French 10th Army. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, 
but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com GW50 to get 50% off. Get cash for clothes at Plato's Closet in North Charleston in West Ashley. It's so easy. Recycle, earn cash, repeat. We pay cash on the spot for your trendy, gently used clothing, shoes, and accessories. At Plato's Closet, we buy all seasons, all day, every day. It's time to clean out your closet and cash in. Bring in your denim, graphic tees, athletic wear, shoes, handbags, and more. Sell your styles to Plato's Closet for cash. Then do it again. Plato's Closet, located in West Ashley on Sam Rittenberg Boulevard and North Charleston on Rivers Avenue. On September the 30th, troops under Maud Hu were arriving in the area around Arras, and they arrived just in time to stop the first German attack in the area, which fell upon them the very next day. At this point, Maud Hu thought that it was only German cavalry and maybe some scattered infantry facing him, so he probably wasn't overly concerned with the situation. In fact, at this time, the 5th Bavarian Reserve Division was advancing toward this French city of Dois, to the east of Ross, and they ran into a French attack in the same area. The French were able to stop the German advance, but as more German troops arrived in the afternoon of October the 1st, they were able to surround Dois, and with several thousand French trapped inside. By the evening of the 1st, the French had surrendered, and the Germans had taken the town, with a total prisoner haul of around 2,000. On October 2nd, French troops from the south started arriving in force. Really, if you look at it from modern-day perspective of supply chain management, this is just in-time delivery at its finest. Troops arriving from hundreds of miles away, just as they are needed on the front. But anyway... These French troops arrive and are put into the line to try and stop the Germans from advancing to the west of Dois and into Arras. On October 2nd, the Germans were advancing over the entire line, from Drucourt in the south to Frenot in the north. On October the 3rd, their advance on the city of Arras would begin in earnest. They would reach the suburbs of the city on the 3rd, but there they would be stopped by strong French resistance. At this point, the French line runs from the south into the city of Arras, and then north in front of Vimy Ridge. With their advance on the city halted, the Germans began attacking in the north in an attempt to capture Vimy Ridge. During this fighting for Vimy Ridge, a gap developed in the middle of the French line that actually had some French commanders very seriously considering retreating from the area and giving it over to the Germans. They would eventually decide to stay on their current line in front of Vimy Ridge, which would be under constant attack for the next few days. By October the 4th, the main thrust of the action was beginning to shift to the north, but the Germans were still launching some attacks to try and capture the ridge. On October 4th, the orders came down for there to be a German attack in the middle of the day, in broad daylight, which the leaders on the spot decided wasn't such a great plan. They found reasons to delay the attack, and late in the evening they would finally begin their assault. This final large attack would be successful, and the Germans were able to capture the town of Vimy and part of the ridge to the west. The Germans were not able to capture the entire ridge, but they were able to get a very good foothold. Over the next several days, the Germans would continue small attacks in the area, which allowed them to capture more and more of the ridge. Finally, on October the 9th, the French would launch their final counterattack in the area, but it was defeated. The attack, unbeknownst to the French, was actually close to success. So close that all of the reserves that the Germans had in the area were quickly rushed forward to fill gaps in the line. This rushing forward of troops would cause units to get horribly mixed up, and the Germans would take several days to sort out the mess that had been created. On October 5th, 
there would be a slight shake-up of the French command structure. On that day, General Foch would arrive to take command of the entire northern sector of the French armies. This was done by Joffre, because as the fighting continued to expand northward, the coordination between the participating armies became more and more difficult. By the 10th, the fighting around Arras had died down a bit, and the fighting had... any guesses? Yep, it had moved north. The action would flow into the Battle of La Bassie, which would be more sprawling of a battle than what we have discussed so far, and would run from October 2nd all the way to November 2nd. Remember what I said last week about battles lasting months? This is only the beginning. This battle was fought in the area between Arras in the south and Ypres in the north. During this time, the French Second Army, veterans of the battles of Albert, Picardy, and Arras, were pretty much just told to sit and hold the line, while the primary point of Everett was taken up by the French Tenth Army, under Matou. This also marks the first time that we have encountered British forces on our race northward. These troops were under the command of General Smith Dorian, and made up the Second Corps of the British Army. This marks the first appearance in the war of some of the British colonial soldiers, in this case soldiers from India. Belonging to the Lahore Division, these soldiers were fresh off the boats from India, and as was the British custom, they were all Indian soldiers with British officers. These soldiers would show incredible bravery in the coming battles, even if their dietary requirements caused some issues for British quartermasters. They would equip themselves well on the battlefield throughout the entirety of the war, and were just the beginning of the British utilizing their vast colonial empire in the fighting. While fighting in the area would begin on October the 2nd, the battle would begin on October the 14th, with the British slowly pushing forward while pushing back light German resistance. At this point, the German lines were mostly held by thinly spread German cavalry and light infantry, so they never really had a chance to resist the British advance and instead they instituted a series of counterattacks that hindered the British and kept them off balance. The German 6th Army would begin to arrive on the 18th of October, and that is when the defense of the area would really start to stiffen. Before the Germans were able to bring up enough men to fully stop the British advance, now with the help of the French, the Entente armies were able to capture Givenchy in the south and gain a foothold on the Abers Ridge to the east of Neuchapelle. By the 19th, enough German troops had arrived to fully stop the British and French advance, and the next day they began to counterattack. Already, by the 20th, you can see that the tendencies of the last few weeks would come into play, as the British soldiers in the south of the line were already digging in, while just to their north, other troops were continuing to try to advance. It was actually pretty difficult to dig trenches in this area due to the high water table that made any ditch deeper than a foot fill with water. The armies in this area were forced to improvise by creating breastworks above ground to try and provide some protection. It also made them great targets for artillery. On the 21st, the Germans were now on the attack, and had been able to punch through the British lines near the northern edge of the battle. Throughout the day they attempted to make their breach wider and deeper, but were defending against constant counterattacks. By around midday, the British were finally able to drive the Germans back, thanks to great usage of our supporting artillery fire. However, with these attacks, the last groups of British reserve troops were put into the line, and there wouldn't be any available for several more days. Partially due to this fact, Smith Dorian ordered a line of defenses built to the west of the current British line, to give them something to fall back to should it be required. This line ran from Givenchy to New Chapelle and then to the north and it was worked on by both British engineers and French civilians. They didn't have a ton to work with in terms of materials, but they did their best. The British would fall back to these positions before the next German attack on October the 24th. This attack began at 2 a.m., and while the Germans were able to make some headway, they suffered heavily at the hands of British artillery. On the evening of the 24th, the Germans tried another attack, this time to the south of New Chapelle, to similar results. The next day, they attacked yet again, this time being thrown back after hand-to-hand -hand fighting. The next day, finally, there were no attacks. On this day, the British reinforcements began to arrive. On October 26th, the Germans would attack again towards New Chapelle, and this time they were able to gain a foothold in the town and to push the British back out of their positions. 
Early on the 27th, the British tried to counterattack, but these attacks were complete failures. By the evening of the 27th, the British were forced to concede Neuve Chapelle to the Germans, and they retreated west of the town. They had lost a lot of men trying to defend this town. An example being that three battalions, which in total had 600 men. Each of these battalions should have had more than that, just by themselves. On October the 28th, the Indian troops of the Lahore Division were used in an attempt to recapture Neuve Chapelle. They had just arrived in the area just a few days before. They were brought up, and the attack began at 11 a.m., and at first they had some success, and they were actually able to retake most of the town. After most of the town was taken, they were subject to murderous counterattacks by the Germans, and were eventually forced to retreat. Their casualties were staggering. One Indian unit started the attack in the morning with 300 men, and by nightfall, they came back out with 60. The battle line began to settle down at this point, with the Germans in command of Neuve Chapelle. More troops from India were arriving every day, and they were formed into an Indian Corps, which was made to relieve the Second Corps. This relief had to be done under the cover of darkness to avoid German artillery fire, and therefore took several days. The Second Corps would get a well-deserved ten days out of the battle line, but as is the way with war, most of the units would be back into the fighting after only a few days' rest. The Battle of La Bassie was over, and it had cost the French and British 15,000 men. The German figure was also large, although an exact number isn't known. All that is known is that it was above 6,000. What mattered was that both armies were stopped once again, and the fight was shifting northward. It would move north into the area around Ypres, an area that would consume German and British forces for the next four years. This is, however, where we end for today, and next week we won't be coming straight back to continue our race. Instead, we will be going back into the east for the Battle of the Vistula River. We will then check in with Belgium, where the war started, to find out how the fortress city of Antwerp is holding up. Finally, we will take our first trip around the world, to find out why this truly was a world war, as fighting gets going pretty much everywhere there's a European colony, which is pretty much everywhere. Uh -huh.